Hello, welcome to this video on end user computing and systems approach. So we'll start by looking at end user computing, then we'll look at systems approach to thinking, and then we'll look at ICT appraisal methods. So what is end user computing? End user computing is basically referring to systems that are used or developed by non-IT people. So this could be applications that people create for themselves in their offices to make their work better. Or in a general way, it's the tools that people who are not IT related use in their work. But in this course specifically, we're going to look at end user computing in the sense of tools and programs that, I, uh, that end users who are not IT people develop for themselves to use in their own work. So, is, so end user computing can be viewed from various perspectives. We can look at end user, end user computing as O2s by which non data processing staff handle their own problems without professional programmers. So this is also related to all the tools that non IT or non programmers create for themselves um, outside of the company IT policy, so to speak. It also looks at the creative use of data processing by non IT people as well. It also looks at um, the use of computer hardware and software by people in the organization who are not really um, IT people or people who use information systems. So, yes, in, a, in another aspect, we could say end user computing refers to everyone who just uses um, a computer system or an information system. But in this case and in this course, we are looking at how, how if possible, or if at all, do we allow non-IT people to create their own systems and then integrate them into the whole IT environment of an organization? So the, main, the three main types of end-user computing um, that we have is where we say end-users develop their own systems, which they use for their own work. End-users control the hardware as well as uh, the applications that are purchased by the organization for their use. So in this instance, instead of the end users developing their own company uh, purchases or comes up with the applications for them and then hands over them and they have full control over those applications. And then the last one is the common one where the end user uses the existing information systems. And this one is the common one where the company um, has got an IT department that controls all the use as well as the deployment and management of um, any existing information systems in the business. So we are mainly going to focus on the first one, which is end user developed computer based systems that are developed by the people for themselves. So what are some examples of end user computing? One example could be um, a person in a sales department who wants to create reports that are pulled from the corporate database. So they could come up with their own little application, which then integrates or which then sends requests to the database, and then they quickly get out some outputs. It would also be some simple ad hoc queries that are just generated to the database by a user. Or the end user could, could be performing what if analysis with tools um, of their choosing. And these tools will now be taking information from the company's data stores or data warehouses or databases. So as you can see, there's now an issue or a question of how do we know that whatever the end user is doing is safe for the organization? Because there has to be a point in time where the user's application has to interact with the, with the company's systems or the company's data. And a security issue now arises where we have to ascertain whether this tool is good enough to be integrated into the work of the company or is this tool the best tool for the user to be using? So we'll look at the advantages as well as the disadvantages of um, end user computing so that we can answer some of these questions a bit later. So some of the reasons why people would want to develop their own tools instead of waiting for the IT department to procure or develop them for them is because there could be an applications backlog where the number of applications that the users want or the types of applications the users want are not being provided for by the IT department of the organization. So in so doing, the users find it easier to come up with their own solutions, which they will use to solve their day-to-day -day problems. There's also improved um, tools that can help users to come up with their own solutions. 
which uh, makes it easy for users to develop their own solutions. So in such a case, instead of going through a long or tedious procurement process, the user would rather just sit down, learn how to develop the, uh, the technology they want, and then use the various technologies that they have to come up with the application that they want. Some of the reasons could also include um, reduced expense of application developed uh, development, and this could also be sanctioned by the company to say, you know what, we do not want to spend too much money on licenses for applications, so we're going to give you the right or the opportunity to come up with your applications. Now, in so doing, there may be also need, say, whilst we're giving the users the opportunity to develop their own application, we may need a central way of coordinating or making sure that whatever is developed can be safely integrated into the company's um, information systems. So this may require a security department that evaluates every application that is developed for any vulnerabilities or security flaws. There could also be um, business analysts or integration specialists who look at how all these applications can be integrated, make sure that all the applications are fighting to, to achieve one goal as well as they are able to work without causing any harm to the computer systems of the organization. So end users include people who are non-programmers, and these people use can use uh, command level uh, instructions to do their work. They could just be functional support personnel. This could be people who are doing whatever work in their departments like HR, sales, procurement, um, administration, and the like. So what are the requirements of a good end user system? So if and an end user sits down and says they want to develop an application for themselves without having to go through IT. Why are they doing that? What is it that they are trying to achieve? So what they want to achieve, firstly, is a, is a system that is easy to use. So a good end user computing system which uh, is developed should be easy to use. It should also be useful. So in, so do, in developing that technology, they need to come up with something that is actually useful, that does the work that they expect to do and produces the actual results that they want. End users could also sit down to develop their own applications because they want something that is enjoyable to use. So some applications that are developed centrally from the IT department may not be as user-friendly as uh, the users would want them to be. So in the end, the users will say, you know what, we cannot use these tools. Let's come up with something that's easy for us to use. And in the process, they innovate and come up with their own tools. Also, a good end user computing system should have um, support available as well as training for those who use it. So if there's a challenge with the system, there should be someone who should be able to fix whatever problems they're having and help others to learn how to use those tools. Then a very important part of end user computing is task technology kit. So the technologies that end users use in their day-to-day -day work should be able to solve the problems that the end users face in their day-to-day -day work. They should also be able to carry out the exact tasks that the users want them to carry out in their day-to-day -day work. So the technology should fit the task. So it's a very important point that whatever is being developed should not be done, should not be just developed because it's the latest technology, but it should be developed because it solves the problem at hand. Also, when developing these uh, end-user systems, there's need for management support so that whenever uh, some challenges or some innovations or changes happen, the management can be able to fight for those end user systems to continue working in the company or to um, finance the various end user projects that are being done. So instead of developing tools uh, that may be thrown out at any time, if you have management support, the management are the ones who are leading the decision making. So they'll be the one also responsible for making sure that whatever is being developed can continue working in the organization, regardless of the various changes that can occur either in the company or in the operating environment. Then you also need to have good human computer interaction factors, such as consistency in the design, error handling, the two should be able to handle error, error as well. It should be ergonomics, it should be uh, easy and comfortable to use, color coding, should use friendly colors, etc, etc. So those are some of the requirements for a good end user system, and there could be many more, but the whole idea is a good end user system should have management support, it should have good task technology fit, and it should have um, some IT support for it to be able to, 
to be updated and to continue functioning in the event of any challenges or changes in the IT architects. Now, what are the advantages of allowing end users to come up with their own programs or systems which are outside of the IT department? Some of these advantages include the systems developed will be tailored to the user. So since it's the user developing them, they would create systems that are best for themselves. It also in, it encourages innovation and creative use of information systems. And this may allow the organization to realize value from innovations from non-IT people, which the IT people or other people might have not recognized or realized um, in the operation of the business. So allowing other people, one and IT, to come up with technological solutions can actually result in coming up with very creative solutions that can propel the business forward. In some instances, it can generate competitive advantage because now your, your employees are more productive and they are more engaged in their work because they're using tools that they like. It also allows information to be closer to users because users are now using tools that, they, that can take the exact information that they require to be closer to them. And then it also increases user awareness of information systems. Users understand what information systems are used for. And it also relieves workload of IT professionals now and then. So IT people no longer have to work with some issues, but now may have to focus on the main infrastructural or architectural stuff that will allow the integration and management of the various end user computing systems that have been developed. But while we have these um, advantages, there are also disadvantages to end user computing. And I think it's the disadvantages that we need to focus more on and see if we can actually overcome them in coming up with end user computing policies in the organization. The first one, the first disadvantage is users can come up with inappropriate systems. Now the word inappropriate can mean anything. It can mean a system that um, is vulnerable security-wise, a system that uh, has got all the wrong commands or it's wrongly programmed or the logic is wrong. So it may end up producing wrong data, which can lead to wrong decisions, which can lead to wrong strategies in the whole organization. So a huge disadvantage is that we are, we are trusting, we are entrusting the process of developing a system to a person who has not been trained in how to make sure that a system uh, an information system that is developed does the exact job that has been done. So we are just allowing anyone to just come up with a system without really going through the actual formal processes of ensuring that the system does what, it, what it's supposed to do without causing any harm to anything else. There's also the danger of duplication of systems where users in different um, functional units or in different departments can develop the same system which will be doing the same job and as a result, these systems will become duplicates in the organization. So we end up having 10 systems doing the same thing, which means we are either wasting time or we are using a lot of system resources doing the same thing, but in many different ways. Another huge disadvantage of end user computing is it takes away users from their real job. So if a person is a sales uh, rep representative, they are supposed to focus on selling the company's products. But now they are taking half of their day away from selling and they are focusing on developing a tool which may or may not even solve the problem that they want to solve. And as a result, their productivity can actually be inhibited by focusing on stuff that has nothing to do with what they're actually being paid for. It can all, the end user computing can also introduce or ignore long range or technical issues. So there could be a technology that has been developed by, by a student that we liked and we have allowed that technology to come into the organization. But what we may not realize is that in the long term, this system has not been created to be compatible with other systems. This system has not been created to be future-proof security-wise. This system has not been created to be able to be accessed via rem um, remote access, for example. So in so doing, we are basically coming up with technologies that are ignoring the future or compatibility um, issues that may arise in the future. And as a result, it may cost us you, um, in a big way when we now are trying to to either migrate from that technology or trying to update that application that was created to suit the new um, technologies or operating environment. And as, as has been alluded to through all this uh, discussion, there are huge integration and security problems that arise by allowing end users to develop their own systems. So 
would it be better for end users to develop their own systems or it would be better for the IT department to centralize all the systems and manage them themselves rather than to allow people to come with their own. I personally think it is better to centralize the development of these systems. However, you can actually allow users to develop their own systems, but bring them to IT before they're even de developed or, or deployed into the organization. So you would not allow, for example, a, a user to come up with a system that connects to the company's database without approval from IT. So if they've got a system that they've developed that requires connection to the company database, then they would need to take it to IT first, first and the IT will test the system and make sure that it's worthwhile. But generally, I wouldn't encourage that approach. I would rather say if a user needs something, they would rather take the request to IT and then IT um, comes up with a solution for that, even though IT may not limit the timelines that uh, the user requires. So there's a trade-off there where IT is safer but may be slower and the user is faster but is um, is more dangerous. So we have to reach a compromise in terms of the speed of delivery of a solution as well as the security of the company's IT information and IT infrastructure. So some of the risks that uh, come with end user development or end user systems that users may use information that is out of date in developing their systems or they may produce information that is inaccurate in developing their systems. Also, it may, it may lead to users having to export information from other systems before it can be used by the end user. So this may uh, result in information being everywhere and also since information is exported, it may also be information that is out of date by the time it is used. There's also the risk of corruption of information that is held in central databases. If the um, end user system does not adhere to proper database connection methodologies or technologies. And also the issue of insecure systems, which may result in information being stolen um, and systems being hacked through the end user developed system, which may not be secure. So how do we evaluate whether a system is good? So we can evaluate whether a system is good by two things. Firstly, by looking at the advantages, which we looked earlier. And then secondly, by looking at the following list, which some of, uh, some of which we have already discussed before. So we can ask ourselves if the system is being used. If the system has been in use for a long time and it's being frequently used by the end users, then it may be a good end user system that we may have to adopt at the company. We also need to look at if the techn task technology fit exists as we have discussed earlier, and also to look at if that system can be developed further into a bigger system that can do more and then incorporate the smaller systems into one big system for the organization. We also need to look at, can it be easily integrated? Can it easily work with other systems? Does it provide consistent results all the time? Can it adapt to changes in technology or operating environment? And does it improve the productivity or efficiency of, uh, of the end user at the end of the day. Because if it doesn't improve the productivity or efficiency of the end user, then the system is just wasting time and it's not providing any value to the organization. So we have looked at what end user computing is all about. Where we said end user computing in this leg, in this course, we are, we are focusing on systems that are developed by non-IT people for their own use within their own departments. And we looked at why people would do that, some of the examples, of end user systems that are developed and the reasons why they would develop them. And, the ad and we looked at the advantages and disadvantages of end user computing and how we can also evaluate whether an end user computing system is worth it or not. So now we want to move to the systems uh, approach or the systems thinking approach to problem solving. So the systems thinking approach to problem solving is basically a holistic approach where we look at all the various factors that are contributing or that affect or influence a certain situation so that when we are now trying to find the solution to this situation, we are not narrow-minded and trying to uh, force a certain solution on, this, on the problem, but we rather look at all the various factors that are at play within, within the environment before we actually start deciding on which solution is the best one. So the systems thinking approach is different now from the traditional ways of, uh, sort of problem solving, where we try to break everything into its constituent parts. And then we try to look at the various elements, 
separately and to say, okay, based on these various elements, this one is the one with the problem. How do we solve the problem with, uh, on this one so that the rest of them can work together? But with systems approach, we are taking all of them as one unit and we are looking at them as the whole unit and saying, if we are going to solve this problem, how is the problem going to influence or affect every other element within that whole system or within that whole situation? So with systems thinking, we are looking at a full picture of the problem. We're looking at all perspectives and trying to find the best solution for that problem. So the systems approach to problem solving is as follows. The first thing we do is we define the problem. We have to first look at the situation, understand the situation, then we define the problem. After we have defined the problem, we then come up with multiple solu possible solutions that we can use to solve the problem. So here we're not saying, um, because this is the problem, this is the only solution that we're going to do. No, even if we know the most obvious solution, we still need to come up with multiple solutions that, are, that could possibly be used to solve the problem. Because by so doing, we may unearth or uncover some problems that, may have, that we may have with the so-called best solution, or we may actually find advantages of using other solutions other than the one that we had in mind. So after coming up with our multiple possible solutions, we then choose the best solution from those uh, multiple solutions. And then we see, and then we take that best solution and design it into the final solution that we're going to uh, finally implement to solve our problem. And then after implementing the solution, we then monitor and evaluate whether the solution works well. If we are not able with the solution, we go back to the problem definition stage and start the whole process again until we come up with a solution that satisfies us and then we bring an end to the whole process. So this is all about a systems approach to problem solving. You start with a problem definition, coming up with alternative solutions, selecting the best solution, designing the solution, then you implement and evaluate that solution. So those are the basically the main steps of uh, of a systems approach to problem solving. Now this approach can be used to solve other any problem, regardless of whether it's an IT problem or not, but also good for solving actual technical IT problems so that you do not break the integrity as well as the consistency and coherence of an application. Finally, in this video, we're going to look at ICT project appraisal methods. So ICT project methods are ways of assessing whether an IT investment that we made was worth it or not. So we're now like trying to look at, we are trying to look at if we got any value from the actual purchase or hiring or the contract we signed with other people. So here I've got three main methods. The first one is the payback period. Uh, method. So the payback period is looking at if we bought hardware for a certain amount of money, how long does that that does it take us for us to recoup the money that we used to buy the hardware? So if we bought, let's say, a, a server to be able to present our web our customers with a website on which they can purchase our our goods online, then we'll look at how if the website costs five thousand dollars, how long does it take us to get our five thousand dollars using from the online um, purchase methods in order to justify that this was a worthwhile investment. And then we also look at uh, the return on investment, where we look at based on what what we invested, if we managed to get anything worthwhile, or is has there been an increase in our in our profits or our profitability, or whether it's productivity that we wanted to achieve. We look at our various metrics that we can use to see if we actually got a good return on our investments. Then there are also some intangible or indirect benefits that are not quantitatively measured, but are rather qualitative. For example, um, is there high customer satisfaction being registered? How is the staff morale these days? Is there an increase in efficiency uh, generally in how people are doing their work? Are people generally happier? Are they coming to work on time and the like? So some of those, uh, the benefits, some of the ways you can actually measure whether an IT investment is worth it or not can be intangible, cannot really have um, a figure that you can put to it, but you can see by the general atmosphere around you that things are actually moving on better. So in this video, we looked at the end user computing approach to systems development. We looked at the systems thinking approach to problem solving, and we also looked at ICT project appraisal methods. Thank you very much and hope you have enjoyed this video.